through this. All right. All right, we're recording. Go ahead. All right. Um, welcome, everybody, um, to our Poetrek informational webinar. Um, Sarah and Janet here with ARCUS, and we'll be hosting this webinar for you today on August 9th, 2012. Um, we do have people that have joined by computer as well as by phone, and um, so please bear with us while we work with those people if they have technical difficulties as we go along. Um, we have a very long and uh, information-packed webinar for you today. Um, I just pushed out a slide that shows, um, and I'll let Sarah take over after this. Sorry. All right. um, I just pushed out a slide that shows the platform that we're using. It's called Blackboard Collaborate. And the presentation slide should be shown in the center of your screen. Um, you can see that there's a list of participants. We will not be using video today at all, so you won't see any, anybody's face. Um, the, above the list of participants are some little icons if you're uh, joining us through the Internet. Um, there's a little hand one, and that lets you raise your hand, um, lets us know you have a question. Um, you can also type in questions or say anything down in the chat area. We will be archiving this event and uh, posting that on the website um, when it's all done. If you joined us by phone, you can star six your phone to mute it and star six to unmute it. And um, we will um, try to get through this whole presentation, um, address all the questions at the end, and then um, you know if you get a chance to ask a live question, that's fine. We'll tell you how to do that at the end. But um, most of your questions, I think we should cover today. Okay, so what do we got up here? Um, this presentation is actually geared for both teachers and researchers. I'm not sure who we have. A lot of people signed up today, but um, we want to go through what is ARCUS, talk a little bit about Polar Trek, a lot about what we are about, um, which you can read online, but we're going to reemphasize some of the program highlights, and including the impacts and benefits that we've found. We'll go over the applicant application process, what happens if you're selected, what happens if you're not, and again, address any um, questions that you might have sent us in by when you registered. So what is ARCUS? Um, ARCUS, where Sarah and I both work, is based in Fairbanks, Alaska, and we're part of a nonprofit corporation. Um, it's a 5013C, and we um, have member based where we have members coming from all different um, areas of the world, uh, mostly Arctic related, and our members are institutions that are um, primarily doing Arctic research. Um, our goal at ARCUS is to help um, provide leadership and, and knowledge on what is happening in the polar regions. And we do a lot of different activities. And um, Polar Trek is just one thing that ARCUS does. And if you haven't ever been to the ARCUS website, it's actually arcus.org, www.arcus.org. And so they have a different URL than Polar Trek. Um, ARCUS was, um, its relationship to Polar Trek, Trek is that we were awarded funding from the National Science Foundation Office of Polar Programs. We put in a proposal um, and we created this program called Polar Trek. The current um, grant that we are working on is the 2010 to 2013 grant. It's a four-year project, and our goal is to place approximately 48 teachers over the four years um, in the polar regions. Um, we, this is not a new program to us. We've done things like this before. Um, as you can see on this slide, we had another grant during the International Polar Year, again from NSF, that was from 2007 to 2009. And then Prior to that, we had year-to-year -year grants um, uh, putting teachers in the Arctic, and we called that program TREK. And uh, like I said, our role with ARCUS is uh, our, our other things that we do at ARCUS um, go beyond this, and we've had a lot of education outreach projects uh, prior even to TREK and Polar TREK. So um, this is a 
a little glimpse of the Polar Trek staff, um, myself and Sarah and some of our talented people that we work with on a regular basis. We have our web guru, Ronnie Owens, and we have a systems guy, Zeb, and his brother, Joe Ed, that do video work, and then our um, support staff for lead people, Susan Fox, who's our executive director, and Helen Wiggins, as well as um, actually several others, and uh, just uh, to show you how telecommunications and how well Arcus works with uh, around the globe, um, some of our staff actually are not even located in Fairbanks, Alaska, or situated around uh, various parts of the country. Um, so what is Polar Trek? So Polar Trek stands for Teachers and Researchers Exploring and Collaborating, the Trek part. Obviously, it takes place in the polar regions. And, but I think the key thing here is that it's professional development for teachers. And we do this through the research experience. Um, it's geared primarily for the formal teacher, um, K through 12, but we do accept informal teachers, and we'll get to some of those questions I know people have in that area later on. Um, you go out on a, a research experience out in the polar regions for um, anywhere from two to actually eight weeks. And um, it's beyond you teachers just observing and reporting science. It's actually becoming part of the team and learning about the science so you can take it back to your classroom. And we say it's transformational. So a little bit about the goals and project elements. So we look at, um, we have uh, one big goal, which is outlined here, and the goal is to advance polar science education by improving content knowledge, teacher content knowledge, instructional practices, expanding, um, expanding researchers' understanding of the education system, as well as enriching the outreach and dissemination of polar research across all disciplines. And so. Basically, everything we do is centered around that. And we've developed this model that you should see on your screen. It's just a circle with all the different elements and the ways we connect to the different, um, different uh, groups. Um, and we use this model to uh, structure our program. So how does it work for you? So um, the next slide uh, shows some of our high, or kind of program activities that um, most people are interested in, <laughs> and, uh, and this is kind of what you, what you do see. Um, we have a one-week uh, orientation here in Fairbanks. Um, it includes a lot of different training, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, we have a, a comprehensive selection process, which is why most of you are on this webinar, is to understand that process. Um, Part of that process is that uh, researchers make the final selections on the teachers, not Sarah and myself. We provide a lot of logistical support and we cover a lot of expenses and we have a really good alumni and um, we have even some uh, funding and, and support for beyond your field uh, research experience. So we'll get into those details here in a moment, but those are kind of our key program activities. The nitty gritty, teacher, the teacher research experience. Um, obviously, you're matched with the research and you go to the polar region. I already said that experiences last from two to six weeks. That was, that's what we advertise, but in reality, it's at least three weeks. Um, sometimes it's more. Um, if you're going to Antarctica, it's a long ways away and uh, very expensive. So sometimes it can be up to eight weeks. Um, it's an intense field work experience for the teacher, and our goal is to, to, to become a member of the team, not just a bystander. We have a comprehensive safety and classroom training piece, and we also have really great outreach expectations and communication out expectations um, and uh, beyond daily communications. So we have a lot of um, things that make up that teacher research experience. The next piece is about... Um, trying to figure out, oh, uh, where do you go? Um, you end up going to uh, all different places in um, the Arctic. <laughs> Sarah. <Yeah. laughs> and the polar region, Sarah's been talking to me in another world over here. She's getting me all balled up. I don't know what I'm talking uh, no, we were, we were in the chat room here. There's one or two people who aren't seeing the slides, and I'm just telling them they need to 
<laughs> log in, log back out. That's all. There is the PDF. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's just hard when you're talking to keep track of whatever else is going on. So Don't sorry. Worry, I've got the chat. You're all if back. I'm speeding along and you're not with me, I'm sorry about that because I didn't see anything happening in my chat world over there. Um, so anyway, uh, for those of you that do see slides um, and are following on the phone, I'm on the slide that shows the polar expedition locations to the little stars. <laughs> so I know some of you are following by PDF. So. Um, basically, this gives you an idea of where uh, teachers are matched up with the research projects, and you know, and it's all across the Arctic and and in the Antarctic. Um, so this is where we've been to date. Um, another major component of the experience in Polar Trek program is besides going out in the field, which is the really cool part, is that we do um, provide professional development. And actually the experience itself is professional development. You're immersed in science content and you're learning all to handle all sorts of probably new and interesting scientific equipment. Um, you're uh, working together with researchers and other teachers and trying to find how to translate that science you're learning to the classroom. And then, you know, you, um, we work with you to take that experience into the classroom and you utilize it to ch change how you teach science in the classroom. That's our goal. So that's what uh, the professional development piece looks like. Um, the, uh, like I said a little bit earlier, we have a we have a lot of tools available for the team, um, particularly the teacher, but the team is welcome to use them as well um, for classroom and public outreach. And we support it. Um, a lot of it's supported through the website. We do um, Polar Connect presentations, which are like this. They're real-time webinars where the classrooms can connect with the research team from the field. If communications work. We have a spot for online journals, for uploading videos and sharing little snippets of what you're doing out there. Um, we have online photo albums. We have Ask the Team forums where, you, where students or the public can post questions and they're responded to by either the teacher or the researcher. So we have, and that's not all, that's just kind of the highlights there. Um, and uh, this is how we try to get you connected to the public and to your classrooms while you're out in the field. And then we have other resources available for when you come back. So um, the other piece of our model is to provide an ongoing, you know, a really supportive community that goes beyond your field experience. Um, the way that we've built that into our program is that we actually do have extra funding. Um, some people choose to use this um, funding for pre for travel to go visit their researcher before the field. Others choose to use some of this funding. Uh, um, for after the field experience and where they go and maybe visit their researcher at a lab or have the researcher come to their school and visit their school or maybe they go to a conference together. So we do have some limited funding for um, the teams after and before the field um, experience. Um, we also have a really good alumni network that we use and we try to match you up with those teachers we try to match the teachers that um, get selected up with those other alumni teachers um, so that you can get their advice. We have a network, with a Polar Sphere network, which is at the moment is mostly an online newsletter as well as some social networking tools that we use to connect the alumni and we're working on trying to make that a little bit more robust. Um, we have an online learning resource database. I don't know if anybody's explored it, but there's um, web websites and, and lessons developed by the teachers and uh, videos and a whole collection of resources that kind of um, follow along with these expeditions as well as point you to some good resources in the polar region. And we have an email listserv, which is probably how most of you got this announcement. And then we've been, um, we are really tied into a couple of international communities um, that are polar focused and uh, we've been using them to help um, support our teachers and, and provide additional opportunities. So sorry if I'm speed talking here. I want to get to everybody's questions. Um, so program impacts and benefits. Um, this is just to give you a quick uh, look at, at why you want to become part of our program and, and uh, in one way or in another. 
uh, teachers, of course, uh, benefit because you become part of the science team, and that's that's really the crux of it. You you get to learn science in a whole new, fun, engaging way, and uh, take that back into your classroom. Um, many teachers that have been to our program have um, have been rejuvenated about the experience, and they really enjoy working with um, us and the researchers because they're treated like a professional. Sorry to say, I heard that sometimes that doesn't happen. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully it does through Polar Trek. Um, of course, uh, you develop this new network of people and and like minds, and um, you could, that you can reach out to for for the future. And um, many uh, people have said, I on one of the slides about Politrek, I said it was transformational, and it, and for many of the uh, teachers and researchers, it has been life changing and um, has changed what they do in their careers and and especially how they teach science. Um, I just like this. This is a um, a word cloud about some of the um, what teachers that have been through our program have gained in science content knowledge, um, and we collect this through an evaluation process, which I didn't mention anywhere. But we do have an evaluation process uh, that's all integrated into this program, um, and obviously they learned something new. <laughs> So um, how do researchers benefit? What do they get out of this? Well, you get a really excited, hardworking team member. We've heard comments from researchers in the past that sometimes they're even more hardworking and more motivated teachers are than their grad students. So um, they, uh, uh, you, you, you're enthusiastic people and excited to learn, and the research community um, sees that when you become part of the research team. Um, Teachers are great communicators, and we give Politrek really works hard to give you tools and talk about how to communicate science. And when you when you figure it out, you guys are awesome at it and um, are able to communicate that complex science to a variety of publics and in a variety of ways, which is a um, wonderful resource for researchers because researchers don't often have access to people like that in their profession. Um, obviously, a researcher is um, um, contributing to improving STEM education, and by having a teacher um, work with them side by side, um, it builds connections to the education community, as well as te researchers are often part of institutes that are also their faculty members, and many of them are also teaching, so they pick up tips and on how to be better teachers um, themselves. Um, okay, so on the other biggie of who gets to benefit from these type of experiments or experiences are students. Um, we hear this from the teachers that participate that their students are see that. Ordinary people can do science, and this means the teacher, that the teacher, this person that they see every day is, can do science, and that you don't have to be a scientist really to be, do science, if that makes sense. But anyway, that, that it's not somebody in a white lab coat and, you know, that it's not this whole myth um, that it's just if you're excited about it and having fun and um, wanting to learn that you can, too can go out and um, and do science. Um, the students also make connections with um, with uh, scientists. They can have real conversations with scientists through the forum and on the Polar Connect events, and then even after the field season, for sure. Um, many teachers have brought the research teams back to their schools and and have formed um, formed a nice uh, community with their students and and uh, and the students stay connected with the scientists. And then one real neat thing is that students um, benefit by your by teachers going out in the field because teachers come back with inquiry based science and it's not the same old textbooks and they really get to do hands on inquiry based science. So it's a change in what they've seen in their classroom. And they like that. Okay. So here's the nitty gritty. This is um, this is what most people are interested in, which is the application process and how does it all work. So this timeline is applicable to both teachers and researchers um, that are online with us today. 
Um, right now, the application period is open. Um, it's open till the 3rd of September uh, for both teachers wanting to go out into the field and also for researchers wanting to host a teacher. Um, but if you're a researcher that can't make the deadline, you just need to let us know. We're a little more flexible if you're a researcher. We are not flexible, sorry, if you're an educator. Um, we get a lot of applications and we need to start processing them right away. And I'll explain why we have a little bit of flexibility for the researchers here in a moment. Um, we have a selection committee that we convene. Um, sometime in September they'll start to review the applications. And the selection committee is comprised of past alumni of teachers and researchers as well as a few logistics providers that we work with. And they review all the applications. We narrow this uh, uh, field of applicants down to a top group, which again I'll go into that in a moment. And this top group of teachers are matched to the projects that we select sometime in November. And um, the next stage is that we give a, the researchers that are going to host teachers and the, we give them a stack of applications that we think would be best closely matched to their project. Um, and they review them. They tell us who their top three are that they want to hold phone interviews and we conduct those phone interviews and do all those final selections in December. Um, at least that's the goal for this year, is to wrap this all up in December because of some other deadlines we have. Um, then um, so the work doesn't stop for Sarah and myself. We're still busy in between all that time. But the next time you probably will hear from us will be late February and early March. And if you've been selected, then you'll come to a teacher orientation, which right now we're working on the dates, but it's it's looking like it's going to be mid-March due to the facilities that are available here in Fairbanks, Alaska. It's one week and it's required if you're selected. Um, and then soon after that, you, depending on the expeditions we got lined up and start dates for those things, we will start doing um, getting ready to send people out to the field. And that requires pre-field calls um, for the Arctic ones. Um, we have even some webinars that we hold in between all of that which aren't on this timeline. And then uh, the Arctic expeditions typically run from spring to fall, um, as you can see there. And then uh, Antarctic expeditions start in the late fall and can run all the way into late February of the following year. Um, and then, uh, and yeah, so there's a lot of details that go along with all that, but if you're selected, you'll get to learn all about those things. So how does this matching process work? So what happens is um, your, the application, if you're a teacher, your application goes into, um, gets reviewed internally first, and um, it, well, it gets submitted online, and then we take all those applications and we re review them internally. Um, and then the, uh, we're trying to narrow down the pool, and it says 200 to 100, and that's not really quite accurate. So, um, but what, what we do is in that first internal review is we're looking for people that put basically no effort into the application process. And, and it's surprising. Sometimes that can be a, up to about 50 people or so that wrote one sentences or only half filled out an application or, or for whatever reason they just didn't do a, a you know, an adequate job. Um, so we're just weeding that out so that we don't have to pass that on to the selection committee. And then the selection committee takes whatever uh, applications are left, which is actually um, pretty high. It's not not usually half like that. Um, and they're in, they start reviewing and they have a rubric and a whole bunch of ranking things that they go through. And they narrow it all down in their process um, to about the top 40. And the top 40 applicants um, are, um, are just kind of applications and people that can fit a whole range of criteria. And, um, they, and at the same time, we're looking at what the researchers, what researchers have submitted to the program and what their needs are. And we're trying to, um, we try to match the, the, a good suite of applications to the research projects we're going to host this, this year. And then we contact that research committee and we start sending them um, uh, applications to review. So 
if you are not in the final, well, everybody will be notified in late October about where you are, whether you're done, you didn't make it to the next round, or whether you're in that top pool. Um, and then in November, the researchers will be reviewing these these applications, and you know if they don't like it, if they don't agree with what we sent, they have access to the other applications, and they can look at some uh, of the other 40 or so, or request more applications to review. And then they're told their job is actually to select their top three that they want to conduct phone interviews with um, the individual um, candidates. And we go through that process in um, November, hopefully, and probably a little bit into early December. Um, we'll be finalizing that. And then we contact the finalists and we say, offer them the opportunity one way or another and see what their thoughts are uh, about that particular project. And they either say yay or nay, and we move on from there. Um, our goal is to finalize every, all the projects and all the teachers um, for the coming year in December. And then in February, late February, probably this in 2013, we'll have a webinar introducing all the projects and um, the researchers to one another. And it's a webinar for all the participants to get them set up for orientation. So that's kind of our matching process in a nutshell. Um, the application form itself. Um, there's two. If you're a researcher, you've got one, and if you're a teacher, you have one, and there's appropriate places on the website to go and access that. Um, and they're similar in that they're both online. They combine short and long questions um, for the teachers. It's a lot about uh, your motivation, why you're applying to Polar Trek, how you use this experience, what does your classroom look like, um, telling us some background information about what you've done in the past, um, uh, those kinds of things. Um, for the researcher, it's more about what it is, um, uh, where's your research project, why do you want to host a teacher, where, what are your expectations, and getting to some of the, some of the nitty gritty about what it's like to be in the field or to what's their day-to-day -day activities so we have an idea of where we're placing teachers. Uh, for both as applications, you have to have valid email addresses. Um, otherwise, um, we won't be able to notify you about things. And you can't navigate away from either of the pages. They both have um, uh, a Word document available. The researcher one might not. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I have to check the researcher one. I know. Uh, the, do you remember, Sarah, if the researcher has a web? I'll go and check while you continue the slide. Okay. Um, there is, I know for the teacher application, there's a Word version that you can download and cut and paste into. The researcher one, because it's not quite as labor intensive, um, might not. But we recommend that you download that Word document, cut and, you know, type in your answers in the Word document and cut and paste uh, back into it. Okay. There is one on the researcher. Um, Site. And Christine, I'm going to go double check that teacher application page right now just to see. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, and if you have any troubles with any of those um, Word documents and things like that, please email us and we can send you one through email or something that might work better for you. Yeah. Um, but however, you cannot, we have to have you um, in most cases do, uh, please submit the online one. It's how we collect all the data. Um, and I do not want to have to cut and paste your application into our form if I can avoid it at all trouble, all possibilities. Um, if you do have trouble, just like I said, email us. Um, and don't wait till the last minute, please. Uh, it's amazing how many people submit at the last minute things. But anyway, um, uh, Monday the 3rd of uh, September at 5 p.m. Alaska Daylight Time. And since everybody comes from all different parts of the world, we'll let you uh, convert that time zone to wherever in the world you are. Um, I will give you an idea that it is Alaska is one of the last time zones in the world, Hawaii being, I think, the the, and the Aleutian Islands being the very, very last one. So it's pretty late for most of you. You can do this till pretty late in, the, in your time zones. So um, 
Anyway, uh, yeah, if you have problems with the application, let us know. Some application tips. Please, this is another reason for downloading Word and filling it out there. Spell check and proofread your answers. Have somebody else read your answers. You know, have a family member or a peer read your answers and see if they make sense. Um, we want you to be thorough um, but and concise at the same time. You have a 200 word limit for mo uh, many of the essay questions. Um, be clear about what it is you want to get out of this um, professional development um, and how it impacts your uh, career. We want you to share this experience with others. We have a big outreach activity. Um, and I, I must say that most of these application tips are for, um, for the teachers, but they can be applied to the researcher applications too. You know, be clear about why you want a teacher, um, even if you've never had one. Um, be clear to us about how you're going to uh, use this experience in your classroom, to your community, um, with the public. You know, give us some good examples and um, think out, think outside um, what you normally have done. You can provide past examples. That's a good idea. So if you have a idea, you can share that with us. Um, make sure you address all the parts of the questions. Do your homework. Please look through the website. Look at other journals. See what we already provide. I can tell you that nothing is um, more, I don't know, it's not annoying, but I guess it's troublesome when you can clearly read an application and, and realize that people have never even looked at the website. Um, and then definitely Yes, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Somebody just joined by phone, or we lost somebody? I just joined by phone. Did that be me? Yeah, Hi. and just so you know, if you're following along um, in the PDF, Janet is on a slide called Application Tips. And do you know which slide number that is? Uh, maybe 28. Yeah, probably about 28. Are you following along on a PDF? I am. Okay. Very good. I just wanted to catch up. <laughs> yeah, and here I thought I was going to be early, and thank you for the email. I was thinking 7 o'clock instead of 6. So. Hey, not to worry. No worries. Right, Janet, thanks for letting me interrupt. Yeah. No worries. We'll be uh, archiving this so you can catch back up with uh, the archive pieces too. So yes, we're on application tips. Um, and I, really, the just be thorough. Check your work. Um, I know if you're a teacher, um, you don't like sloppy work. Well, neither do we. So, <laughs> um, so just check it out. And some uh, please don'ts. We're on the please don't slide for the people following um, PDF. Um, we spell Polar Trek for a certain reason. Please double check your spelling. And uh, Polar Trek, Arctic and Antarctic. We can, what can I say? That's our little nitpicky things. Um, and if you're explaining to us about, um, we, we know that going to these places, if you're a teacher that has never been to the polar regions, this is really exciting and it's not written and it's, um, it's hard sometimes to not say, oh, I've always wanted to do this and it's all about me. But um, we don't mind that, but make it not all about I, I, I or me, me, me. Make sure that you explain how you're going to use this in your career and why it's important to you and your students. Um, so uh, write res don't paraphrase essay question answers or write responses that are too brief or vague. Um, Really, if, you're, if they're really, really brief, like one sentence, two sentence, when you got 200 words, uh, um, yeah, those are usually, we cut you out right away. Um, don't submit incomplete ex answers. And um, we really don't want actual, um, we don't need additional documentation. We'll get to that point if we need it somewhere down the road. If you're in a final candidate, we'll ask if, if we need that. Uh, if you said you did some project and, and the uh, researcher's like, I want to know that or wants to check out your website or whatever, we will, go, we will get to that if we need it. So please don't send us anything extra. Um, we're good with just what the application has. Um, again, oh, it, I, one thing I want to note is that it's okay if you submit um, an incomplete application before the deadline or you see some errors or something, you can go back and resubmit your application. We take what the, our process is to take the last application you submitted. So be aware of that. 
um, the last one that you submitted is considered the final. We don't go back through any of them. It's the way our system works with the online things. So, um, you know, if your last one you submitted is just a nothing one and you had one that was too prior, you better email us because we'll have to uh, um, figure that out. So if you need to do corrections or something like that, you can send it to us. Our preference is that you go back through and redo the application if it's very extensive. But if you notice that you had the wrong phone number for the reference number three, you can email us that and we can correct that fairly easily without it being too time intensive. So let us all know, but it's got to be before the application deadline. Um, okay, so what happens? If you're selected, you get to jump around, get really excited, and um, this is what you get. Selected teachers are provided. We're on slide 31 for those following by PDF. Selected teachers are provided um, uh, training for the experience virtually and in person, including the one-week orientation in Fairbanks. So we provide the training, and that's we pay for it. Um, we pay for for you to come to Fairbanks and spend a week with us. And uh, this year, like I said earlier, it's probably going to be in March of uh, 2013. Um, we do have some uh, travel support for pre or post field meetings with your research team or your teacher, depending on who's listening today and where you are. We provide equipment to the teacher that is that is in the um, and that will include a laptop. Um, and we'll, our preference is Mac. Um, we will discuss with you about providing you PCs, but our PC stock is getting limited and more and more limited. But anyway, we go over that with you. You'll get a camera if you need one that does have some video capabilities as well as any related accessories. Um, most of the gear that you need for either work in the Antarctic or the Arctic any time of season um, will be provided by our logistics providers to the teachers that are going on these expeditions. Um, you know, if it's, it won't be underwear, but it will be outerwear. Um, some cases in Antarctica you even get long underwear. So we go through that and we, we talk about gear quite a bit and, and we try to get you um, gear from our logistics providers. We also, if you're traveling on an expedition during the school year and you're a teacher, we do cover your substitute costs. Um, we cover it during the orientation training um, here in Fairbanks as well as during the school year. So we do, and that's reimbursable to the schools. Um, we uh, do not supply um, a stipend, I should add. Um, and then we also cover miscellaneous miscellaneous expenses related to the travel, sometimes per diem and lodging that doesn't get covered by our, our logistics provider, or you have excess bags, or you have um, some of the, all of the Antarctica expeditions require a medical dental um, uh, process qualification. Qualification, yeah, they call it physical qualifications, but basically you got to have checkups by before you can go, and sometimes insurance doesn't cover those extra costs, so we pick that up as well. And um, so yeah, we try to make it so that this is fairly um, that most things are covered, and they, that the teachers don't have to put a lot of um, money towards um, participating in our program, if any. Uh, researchers are provided. Um, uh, basically, you're provided as well in the sense that NSF is, is taking care of all the logistics and all of the, um, all of the cost as much as we can associated with the, with the teachers. And in particular, they cover our logistics providers, all the travel to and, the field, to and from the field for the teachers, meals, the gear, and um, equipment. And um, the one thing that researchers, yeah? I'm going to interrupt again. Did we jo have someone join by phone? Maybe. Okay. I don't know. Oh, Okay. Uh, one thing that researchers uh, don't get is that um, we don't have any funds for researchers to attend our orientation in Fairbanks, although we do, um, we do love it when they do come to the orientation. And um, we don't cover your pre-field communication costs 
you know, outside of our pre-field conference calls and things like that, or if you have to send materials to the teachers and things like that. So there's a few costs that the researchers might incur for supporting a teacher, um, but it won't be um, in relation to the logistics of getting the teacher to and from the field. But we go over that with you, with all of the researchers, and uh, what what gets covered and what doesn't get covered. Um, some costs for teachers that may incur. Um, so this kind of goes along if people wanted to know. Like I said, most everything's covered. You may not get uh, person. There's no personal apparel or gear such as long underwear, except for in Antarctica they do have long underwear. Um, and actually, even the Arctic and the Antarctic they have gloves. But sunglasses is a big one. We don't cover extra pairs of glasses. Um, your medical and evacuation insurance, if they aren't um, covered by your insurance, that may be an extra cost, but actually Arcus picks up that. Um, if you do any personal travel um, that go to, that's connected to the expedition, that's all on your own. We don't do any salary related costs except for um, uh, paying for the substitute, we can't do that. And teachers need to be aware that they do not get a stipend for this program. Okay, teachers' time commitment. What should they expect? Well, you're in for the long haul. Um, <laughs> once you get going on all this, once you submitted your application, it takes a while. So um, you've got that time already, submitted in, uh, submitting applications, and then you've got to wait for us to figure out if you're in the long. Uh, and then you get selected. Then you've got to go to orientation. We have webinars. We have pre and post field calls. You've got the field time. Um, you're going to have to take some time to practice whatever we taught you in uh, February or March. Oh, it says one week orientation in 2011. That should be 12, by the way. Um, you're going to have to take time to practice and to get up to speed. We do have a lot of re-program re um, requirements creating lesson plans when you're done, everything. And so there's a lot of personal time. I'm not, I don't know how many hours, but it's a lot. Um, so, um, but hopefully it's, it's also rewarding. And um, I don't know. I don't know how many hours. I don't know if I've ever had a teacher tell me exactly how many hours they committed to it. I've heard sometimes they groan and moan about the program requirements, and then later on when they're doing outreach, they're like, that was the best day ever, and they've done a conference or they've talked to another school or whatever. So um, you're, once you're in the program, and plus you, you also do alumni activities. So it's really professional development that goes beyond probably anything else you've ever done. Um, but once you fulfill all the program requirements, you know, basically you're done. So I don't know, usually within a year you can be done with everything, everything from start to finish, submitting your application to finishing off program requirements and including the field expedition. But most teachers don't want to be done. They're, they're hooked for life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. It's really hard to put an hour on that one. Uh, researchers, it's a little bit different for you. Um, you have to do some uh, reading of applications to select your own teacher, including some interviews. So that can be time consuming. depends on you and your team and how many of you there are. I just put an estimate of eight to nine hours, but that's probably a little bit under. Um, Participation, we do have some requirements for the researchers um, to participate in a few webinars along with the teachers. We want you to be in the pre and post field logistical calls as well as obviously working with them in the field and sharing as much information that's related to the expedition with your teacher. Um, and that kind of is on an ongoing basis both before and after the expedition. Of course, there's outreach activities, and it's up to you and your teacher and team to determine how much of those you're involved in. And we do have some evaluation components. But again, it's like um, it's the similar as the teacher um, expectations. You're part of the alumni, and, and hopefully you'll stay connected to the program long after um, your field experience with the teacher. Okay, so if you didn't get picked, uh, what happens? So slide, um, what are we on, 37, slide 37, you apply again. Um, I must say right now, I don't know what that's going to look like because this grant actually ends in March 31st, 2014, but we'll keep you posted. Hopefully some, something will be in the future. 
Um, but that shouldn't stop you this next year um, from following other teachers and being part of the group. Um, we have uh, videos and a whole slew of other resources that are available for you. Um, there's photo galleries, there's um, profiles. I mean, there's lots of things you can do with the material that's already online. And you can connect with the teachers that are in the field already um, through live events or just even setting up one-to-one -one classroom to classroom com communications with them. Um, we do already have, um, we have international partners and, and social groups that we're part of, APEX and PEI, Polar Educators International, and the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists um, have Facebook uh, presence and website presence. And so you can join those communities and just be connected to the polar world um, that way as well as through Polar Trek. And we also have an online course that we're uh, offering every semester in the fall and then spring, and there's one in the summer that's going on right now. And you can take those classes as well. So let's get to your questions. Oh, those are some of the faces of Polar Trek. This is a slide of all the pretty, pretty good faces. OK, frequently asked questions. Um, Sarah, is there any questions that have come up so far that I missed or things that No, just but I think. Um, I think you've addressed so many of these as we go through. Uh, I was thinking that once we kind of take a look at what the questions are, perhaps once we go through these sections that we have, we can then use the, the polling tool to say, OK, is everybody good with this type of question? Or if somebody has a question, they can say no and then type in the chat box. Does that sound like a plan? Sure. Sounds good to me. I'll let you direct that when I'm done answering all of them. <laughs> OK. Sounds good. Okay. So, um, what's that? Oh, that's okay. I was just going to tell the people that are following by phone and PDF. We're on um, slide 41. It says, uh, or slide, yeah, slide 41. It says timelines and lengths of expedition. So, hopefully, you're with me. All right. So, um, we did go through what the timeline looks like for your application process for the expeditions that go out in the Arctic field season in the summer, Antarctic in the winter. Um, a couple people have asked uh, about the range of their experiences in terms of how long they'd be out in the field. And people do have many, many commitments at home. Um, and I think when you're applying, be realistic about what you're available for. There's a space in the application where you could say, you know, what time frame or where you want to go. And now that you know, yeah, it should be slide 40. You're right. Um, uh, so sort of be, be honest with yourself about what you are available for. And, you know, a lot of the ship ones are eight weeks long, but some of the shorter ones might only be two weeks. And you will be alerted if you get that far in the process. We'll let you know what the project is like, how long it might last. And, if, and at that point, you can let us know if you're interested. So there are a couple of questions that came up. And I'll just re, re, um, I'll say them again for everybody that's on the phone. Um, the dates of the orientation, uh, we have not set the dates of the orientation. So all we know right now is it will most likely be in March. Um, we'll try to set that here as soon as we can and um, let people know um, both on the website. It's, it's up in the air because of the facility that we're using. So sorry, but um, um, let's see, would it help? Polar Trek, if there was support locally, say for three weeks of substitute teachers. Well, um, oh, yeah. We do have costs and, and all that coming up. So, section of questions here um, timeline, length of expedition. So, above your name in the participant list, there's those icons where you can put a smiley face or raise your hand, and then there's a checkbox. You can say yes or no. So, if you're good with this whole section, go ahead and press yes. If you have a question, Put no, and then we'll let you type that into the chat box. And of course, if you need to email us because a question comes up later, that's fine. All right. It looks like the majority of people are good with this section here. OK. Somebody's typing away. So I guess we'll see what they're saying here in a moment. OK. So the. Are we on to what research projects then? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Just one way for that person to, to type, as you were saying, but I think everybody's doing okay. So I'm going to clear that one. Okay. So keep going. Are you yeah. Go ahead. So research projects, there's all different kinds of research projects. And the reason why when you apply to a Polar Trek or if you're um, as a teacher, you don't get to select uh, what kind of research projects you want to go on is because we're doing, um, we're soliciting from the research pro researchers at the same time we're getting your applications. And so uh, we don't know where our research projects will be other than that they're in the polar regions. And what we try to do is we try to match um, the, you know, the best suited teachers for whatever comes up. Um, and the research, you can look at the website and follow, look at the journals and see what kinds of projects we've done in the past. It's everything from archaeology to um, working in plains, flying over glaciers, to being on the ground collecting soil samples, to looking at spiders. It's the whole gamut of um, Arctic research and or polar research. So. Um, it's really hard to say at this times, but you have the opportunity to select, you know, areas of interest, some science choices. So just be honest about what kind of science you like, so that we can best match you. Um, you will know. Um, let's see. You are not assigned a location, um, or is there some choice involved? Um, so how this works is you don't get you can pick your area of interest if you want to go to Arctic or Antarctic or both, and there's a part in the application as a teacher to say where you want to go and why. Um, and but it, you can't say I want to go to Siberia or Norway or whatever because we don't have that level of detail right now. And so you are just the only time you will hear if you get to the final pool and a researcher wants to interview you. We will give you a call before that interview and, and to tell you more about their project and we'll send you some email um, from the researcher, maybe part of their application or some websites that they have and we say this is what kind of research is being done, this is where it is and this is the location. Are you interested in being interviewed? And you say yes or no and you can get back to us after you've read material and we set up an interview time and then you can ask more details about the research. But it's at that time and I have had teachers in the final interview phase when I say, well, this is like a physical oceanography cruise for eight weeks down in Antarctica, are you interested, yes or no? Um, some teachers have said, no, I, I can't commit to eight weeks in from March to April this year, and so they'll, they won't want to proceed, um, go any further. So that's kind of, you do have a choice, obviously, of whether you go or not, but it's not at this point in time. It comes later in our process. Um, Let's see. Uh, 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 next your, uh, question. Whoops. Go ahead. Uh, I think that goes back to your question on the earlier page, which I don't know that I caught the answer to. Does, at that point, does it become a take it or leave it if you're offered eight weeks in the Antarctic and that is just not doable? You can't be away from school for eight weeks. Are you passing on the opportunity or? Will you work with the selected individual to find something that is agreeable for both the school and for Polar Trek? Uh, good question. So what happens with that is um, your application, if you make it to the final pool, you can, um, so you can go to more than one researcher's pile. You know, a researcher may you may get selected for more than one interview. That's a, a distinct possibility. So in that case, you may end up having some other choices, and and we'll let you know as soon as. Ideally, we try to find out who is all being interviewed within a very tight time frame, <laughs> but um, so that we can say, look, you got you got picked for this interview and you got picked for this interview and here's this research project and here's this research project and you can tell us right then and there whether one's of interest to you or not. What typically happens though is that day one you'll we'll interview you and we'll say, oh, you got picked for this one in Antarctica and you're like, oh, I don't know. And then about two days later, you know, we'll find out, oh, you got picked for another one in the Arctic, blah, 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 we call you and you say, oh, that one sounds better. So you actually have a little bit of, you know, choices. But if you've only been selected by the research team um, to be interviewed one time and you say no, then that's pretty much it because the researchers 
uh, their science campaigns are usually very confined to certain time frames, like particularly for ships and field stations. And you know, there may be a flex, some flex by a week or two, or um, but sometimes it, a lot of times it's actually a very narrow time window of time for them to go out and do their field science. The exceptions to that are ones that are doing science. Let's say there's a couple of them here in Alaska that we've done where they come up to Alaska all summer long. And then in that case, you know, you may get to, you can pick and you can say, look, we're going to be, um, you know, we're going to be in Alaska from May 31st till August 1st, and then you say, well, this part of the time will work better for me than this part of the time, and um, so there's a little bit more negotiation there. Um, it really been, Jen? Yeah. Well, well, before you get to that piece of the process, in your application, you can say what you're available for. So if you already have had, you should already have that discussion with your administration um, and find out what they're up for, what's really possible. Don't yet, it's okay. But you can say, I'm available for two to four weeks. And, you know, if you're not available for eight weeks, we're not going to throw you into a pile for an eight-week expedition. So there is space for you to already give us some of that information. That's true. So yeah, we hope that we give you lots of different times and ways that you can convey, you know, what your needs are and what your um, school's needs are, and and the researchers also do that through their application process as well, and they tell us when their project is going and all that kind of stuff. So that's part of our best matching piece too, is that if you clearly cannot do something during the school year, we will not match you and send your application to a researcher that has a project during the school year. If you've indicated on your research project you cannot, or on your, your uh, teacher application that you can't go for this amount of time, I, we won't even send you, uh, send your application forward to that team, even if you are a good match. Um, yeah, so we're, we try, that's part of our, our work and, and stuff. So be very clear on what your needs are. And, and we realize needs change too. You may fill it out today and then in a month things are different. So just let us know. Just like, hey, I found out that this is happening in my life and either yank my application or amend it or, you know, whatever it is that needs to be done. Does that help? Janet, I can, yeah, I can cover the next couple on this page and I'm documenting the ones that are coming through the chat too. Okay, good. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, sure. So um, how many, let's see, we're kind of up to how are the research this projects decided upon? We will look at, you know, the same way that you guys are as teachers are filling out your applications, telling us compelling reasons why you should be a part of the program. The researchers are doing the same. Um, and, you know, we hope to have diversified projects between the Arctic and the Antarctic. And we'll just be able to see what comes. Um, they're all usually really great uh, projects, so be excited about that. Are there more opportunities for research in the Arctic and Antarctic regions? The on polar trek is, I think, what you're asking. And um, there can be some. There's Earth Watch projects that are up here in Alaska. There are some. So if you, you know, if you don't get chosen for polar trek and you are still interested, contact us and we can see what is available still out there. As well, if you join our email list, you'll get those kinds of notifications. Any types of projects related to engineering or animal physiology, those kinds of things, we're not going to know what the projects are until those researchers apply. So there's two processes happening. Teachers apply and researchers apply. So we won't know until then. That's why we ask you what your top three or few um, areas of study are because we spend that time looking at your application and explaining uh, or figuring out who's paired with who. Uh, back to that one, actually, if you're interested in more than three topic area studies, please just give us uh, a rundown of the top three that you are really interested in and then a tiered explanation beyond that in that section. But then there is a space for you to talk about your science preferences. That helps us fill out a bigger picture, too. So that's how we can do that. Any other, um, let's see, any other pieces? Janet, looks like you... Connection failed without warning. Is anybody still on there? Are you hearing me? Yeah, people are hearing you. It's just some people got boosted out of the room and came back. I don't know what happened there. We lost. Yeah, your voice was cutting out during your explanation. Just 
just a little bit. Huh. So, um, are people okay with this page? Give us a yes if you're good to move on, or an X if you have another question based on these. And again, I'm trying to collect the questions here at the that you're asking. Uh, Christine, yeah, I got two questions. I think for you, I will definitely get to them. All right, looks like the majority of people are good. Uh, let's move on to the next. Okay, so, whoops, go back. There you go. Okay, so for those of you that are following the PDF, we're on, um, I don't know what slide. 42. 42, and it's about cost, cost, gear, fitness, post expedition. So, a lot of answers, so. Yeah, so far we've covered the cost. It's basically nothing. We try to cover all that cost. Gear, we talked about that already as far as that the logistics provider will uh, cover most of the gear. And we go into uh, really detailed pre-field calls to make sure you get your gear you're squared away, what to bring, where it, what it's like to live wherever you're going, all that kind of stuff. So that comes way down the process when you've been selected. We go over all those details. For, for those of you that are just applying, don't worry about any of that right now. Um, the degree of physical fitness is needed. Again, we do ask a very generalized medical question. We don't need to know all your statistics, um, body measurements, or anything. <laughs> um, some places, any, if you're going to Antarctica, you will have to go through a medical dental process. It's called a physical qualification. Even if you're picked by the researcher to go, um, you will have to go through that process. And if you if you don't succeed in that, you don't get physically qualified, then you can't go to Antarctica no matter what. Um, but to date, knock on wood, so far everybody's made it through. You know, some people just have to take additional tests and things like that. And um, some places in the Arctic also require a physical or dental checkups. Um, and we go through that. Again, you will find out about whether you have to do that or not when you get selected and matched um, with a researcher. So. Basically, for that question about physical fitness, we're trying to find a put you on a project um, that we think you'd be comfortable with. We don't want you if you if you get seasick. Obviously, you don't want to be placed on a cruise <laughs> if you get really seasick. So maybe maybe drugs help you or not. But you know, or if you are um, can't carry heavy loads because of some back or knee injuries, um, you all are going to probably want to go on a um, expedition where it requires you to hike 12 miles every day carrying heavy pack loads. So or being bent over um, doing dirt sampling or something like that. So um, just be kind of clear about what you can physically do, I guess. And um, you know, we'll ask more detailed questions when it comes to interview question time. Um, I can yes, go ahead. We did the post-expedition expectations, so we've gone through that. If you have additional questions later, you can email us. Eligibility, I can cover these if you'd like, Janet. Sure. Okay. So is the application open to all teachers nationwide except us? Yes, it is open to all educators, informal or formal teachers, all grade levels. And you might realize when you look at our website that many of the teachers are science or high school teachers. And that is something that uh, the researchers certainly identify with. It's, it sort of resonates with them. Um, I think there was a question from somebody who teaches second grade, and I don't know why I missed that one. Uh, but please let us know that you are outside of that particular gamut of teachers and how it can be useful to your students to bring science into the classroom. So you are there to sell yourself. All teachers are welcome to apply nationwide. A university professor who teaches graduate courses. Yes, you can um, apply as well. We have had some college level teachers. Uh, Jacqueline Hams is a good example. So you can look at her journals and find out what she's up to. So yes, you can apply. Um, you just need to let us know why it is that you would be at the, the top level of selection. How important are the percentage of students who receive free and reduced uh, lunch at school? Are my chances lowered uh, because less have free lunch? I would not say uh, that that is going to hinder you at all. But again, you have to let us know why your students or your career and your school are in the top selection. What is it about your students or your career 
that allows it to stand out. So it is something that we're interested in getting um, uh, all diverse people involved in polar science or interested, but don't let that hinder you in applying. So certainly do apply. Anything you want to add to that, Janet? I'm just addressing um, Christine's thing about administrators applying to the program. We've had administrators to both apply and um, district kind of coordinators, curriculum coordinators, those type of people um, that have applied to our program. Um, yes, but I, I'm just going to say for anybody that's outside of the um, K through 12 system, um, you're going you're to have to make your your case very strong as to why you should get to go and why a, a K through 12 teacher shouldn't get to go. Basically, you're going to and there's not it doesn't mean that it won't happen. You're just going to have to put a little more extra effort and really describe the audiences and people um, that you're going to impact and why why this is so important to you and how it would help uh, further STEM education and things like that. So just be, be clear about what it's for um, because the, the, the premise of our program is that it's designed primarily for K through 12 educators. And NSF is lenient on, on who we can take and they allow for some exceptions and we have done exceptions. So, but you just have to be, make a compelling case. All right, sounds good. While we're talking about like what you're going to put into your application, the question came by in the chat of um, there, there's a need for a sample blog. Who is the audience, teachers, students, or doesn't matter? Um, it is basically one of the big pieces of your work and requirements in Polar Trek is a journal. It's online. You can look at all of the teachers of the past journals and go take a look at that. See what their audience looks like. Yes, it's students, but it's also the public. It is other teachers, so how do they convey their message to all of those audiences? Um, basically, we want to know, get a glimpse into your writing skills or your communication skills through journaling. So it doesn't have to be science heavy, but at least conveying something of import that would be. Okay. All right. How are we on the other page? Does anybody need any clarification on the other page? That, yeah, on this one. Does anybody need clarification? Yes, you're good to go. Or no, I have a question. Looks like we're pretty good. All right. Awesome. Our next page here. And we're almost done, just so you all know. Yeah, just this one and one more question so that we got from researchers. Um, so we just have um, a few more questions that um, many of the teachers sent us. So types of training, um, when you, I didn't go into in depth about what the orientation covers in Fairbanks, but basically it's a very technology intensive as well as we go over all the program requirements and, and, and uh, you learn how to uh, post journals online and answer questions and do Polar Connect events and just all the nuances of using and um, utilizing the website and all the tools that we give you. We also go really in depth about the education and outreach planning that we have, what are all the program requirements, what do they look like. And then the other bonus pieces that we bring up with some of that alumni we were talking about earlier and you get a chance to hear from them how they implement all of this in their classroom or how they what they did out in the field and things like that. So that one week is super intense, but we've heard from lots of people in the past that it's super intense, very, uh, really um, beneficial. Yeah, really beneficial as well as an opportunity to really bond with all the teachers that are part of your cohort. So um, that's that kind of training. And then if there's any specialized training that you need as part of your expedition, like bear safety training or gun safety or or how to walk on ice or helicopter training, all that kind of stuff. That comes with the expedition and we work with the researcher to make sure you get whatever you need. Um, but at this point in time, until you get um, selected, you don't need to worry about that. Um, and I like the next question about advantages of partnering with researchers. Um, and contacting them yourself. So if you do know of a researcher, a polar researcher, in your hometown or somewhere else, and you've already started a collaboration with them and connected with them, um, that is fantastic. Um, 
and basically that's what we're trying to do, get you to connect with the research community. You can apply jointly to our Polar Trek program, um, and there's a, a special form um, that's called uh, pre-existing relationships. You have to, one of you has to submit that on behalf of the team. Um, and basically it explains why you want to work together and how you're going, you know, if there's any in-kind contributions that the researcher um, can provide or maybe your school or something. But anyway, it, it, if you have that pre-existing relationship, you should fill it through the spot on the teacher and the researcher application to name those people and give us their contact information. And then you need somebody from that group, the team needs to submit the pre-existing relationship with their application. Um, and we're happy to take questions on that offline or at other times through emails if you need help in uh, further clarifying what that looks like. But if you got somebody in your hometown, of course it's a beneficial because they're right there in your hometown and you know you can work with them on a much regular basis and that's that's great. So apply together. We encourage you both to apply. Um, I can see the next slide. Okay. All right. So the question is about a uh, program providing travel, which we did speak about, the fact that you can connect with your researcher, specifically about the limited funds for that for a pre-meeting. But is it possible to hold classes from the research site? I'm going to say that this is going to be really tough. And if your administration is asking that of you, you need to have a bigger discussion with them because our requirements are very intensive. And beyond Polar Trek, you are part of a research team. And the work days can be six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours of time in the research field every day. And then you're journaling. So what you can do before you go on an expedition is devise a class plan where your journals are part of the class that students are taking and set your uh, substitute up to be able to use those journals as part of the class. So that's my response to that one. What's the delay in posting between when you write your blog entry and then it's approved and posted? Great question. It's just as you get it done. So it's you know that day if you have it done that day. That's okay, so you're not you're not screening what's being written. Yeah, um, we do read the journals just to make sure everything's like coming out right form in the formatting and that kind of thing. But no, the content is your job. Yeah, and the journals will go live as soon as you because when you're when you're a teacher, you know, or when you're a participant and you're posting the journals um, from the field or whatever, as soon as you hit you know, save, it, it's real-time feed, and it's not moderated. I mean, like she said, we'll read them, but we're getting them just like everybody else, it, just in an email all of a sudden, and we're like, oh, okay, we'll read that, and we can go online and read it. And, and um, so it's, it's real-time right away. Um, What's your uh, blog system program? Uh, Drupal. Our whole website's run on Drupal. Okay. Uh, well, other teachers who are curious about that, we teach you how to use it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please tell me it's better than WordPress. Oh, Drupal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This next question here, uh, specific outcomes that are quantifiable. Yes. So uh, Janet mentioned earlier we do have an evaluator, and so there are pre and post tests for students as well as teachers. That gives us quantifiable information about justifying our program. Uh, beyond that, we've got our lesson plans that are products. There are definitely like legacies of your expedition. So there's quantifiable and um, quantitative and qualitative results of your expedition for justifying the program. Um, I'll answer uh, streaming or Skype. If there's opportunities for this while you're out on an expedition, it depends on where you are located. Um, technology has come a long, long way since the original Trek expeditions. And yes, um, Skype has been used by some teachers um, from some pretty remote places. Um, you know, obviously where the internet connections work. Um, and then I'll answer the last one about the opportunity to work with indigenous peoples in the Arctic. It will depend on on the expedition where its location is. Um, if that is of your interest, again, you can specify that in your um, in areas of interest or things that you want to you know, be part of your expedition. You can, 
actually say that, you know, you'd like to work with people in the Arctic. And when it comes to time to matching, we try to find part, uh, projects that are based in communities where the Arctic people are at. Great. Um, I'm looking to see if I've got all the other questions answered from the chat that I saw go by. Um, one was that if Polar Check, there was local support um, from their school, supposedly, for a substitute teacher for, say, three weeks. Yes, we welcome any extra support that you can find. We'll just say that. Uh, I've got a question here from Mary. What is the typical requirement time frame between completing the field work and submitting the assessment? The lessons, we need those about 90 days, but your other um, outreach plans and documentation of things is, is basically ongoing. Oh, Janet's saying 60. Yeah, I think it's 60, but it, it's due, the, the thing about the lesson plans, there's two of them that are due, two lessons, and they're due um, after your school um, starts again. So if your expedition was in the early summer, you don't have to complete your lessons until after school actually gets started. That's so you can kind of field test it a little bit on your students. But as Sarah said, we have a whole list of other requirements, and we give you a timeline of when they're due. And you know, we try to spread out things, and some things are works in progress, like how you're going to talk to your researchers, and how you're going to do outreach, and other things we require within um, a month of you returning, like your reflection essay, what was your experience like? And uh, some things are required within a week of returning, like you need to get online and post that last journal that you made at home so that we all know that you made it home. Um, so we have a whole range of requirements. Lesson plans is just one piece. I would also say that um, your requirements are a benefit to you. They're not just to advance our program. They're actually to make a better program for you and your career in the future. How many research groups apply and are successful? Uh, Robert, great question. Janet, I'd say let's, we get, let's say, 20 to 25, and we take the 12 that fit our teachers. Yeah, but we must, uh, I must tell you that we've been very successful in the last couple of years of, um, well, actually sent all through Polar Trek, of uh, forming relationships with additional researchers and having additional placements. Sometimes they come through that pre-existing relationship. Other time they're repeats um, alumni and researchers that want to go and the researcher has some money to help <clears throat> pay for some of the um, teacher's costs or the logistics, which is a huge piece of this, um, or substitute costs, things like that. So we've been able to typically go beyond the 12, um, 12 projects and 12 placements per year to um, upwards of 15 and 16. So, um, and then sometimes we get some last minute requests and we're able to um, put teachers out on those last minute requests as well. So yeah, we've been fortunate where we've been able to go beyond that 12, but that's what we, we shoot for. That's our minimum. Yes, one teacher per research group. Somebody was just asking how many teachers per research group. It's one. Um, we try not to do doubles. We have had two teachers, like on ships, cruises, um, uh, two placements on the same, at the same time, same place, same research team, um, and that's not as beneficial as the one-to-one -one ratio. Um, however, that being said, the there may be instances where <clears throat> you're in the same proximity or the same field location as another teacher and their research team going on. For instance, McMurdo, some of you would overlap in Antarctica just because that's the field station people are going to and from, but you would be on a different research um, project. But you may see other Polytrek teachers at the same time. Great. All right, how are people doing on questions in general? Is there anything we haven't covered yet for you? Say yes if you're good to go, or no, I still have more questions. Yes. Kristen's asking, would my participation or lack thereof in other projects of this sort influence my selection for Polar Trek? Mm, if I'm understanding what you're saying, Kristen, Kirsten, sorry, um, if you've been like a NOAA teacher at sea, we certainly have had people who have done programs like that. We want to know how Polar Trek would be different from that experience you've already had. If you have experience working with researchers already, just let us know what makes Polar Trek unique in your previous experience. What sets it apart? And I, I think, think there's a um, question on the phone. 
<coughs> nope. Okay. All right. Looks like people are pretty good with questions. I think James sort of searching through slides here, see if there's anything else we wanna we wanna do. We did get a few questions from researchers. Uh, I don't know if they are on right now, so maybe we'll send them an individual question. But yeah, we're hearing from researchers offline as well. Yeah, I, I just wanted to address this one because this may be for teachers that um, have a prior connection or know of other researchers. There's one question that the researcher asked about how many non-NSF researchers have been paired with Polar Trek. To date, I won't talk so much about the successfulness, the second part, but um, if you know of a researcher, whether they're NSF funded or not, but if they're a polar researcher and they're interested in having hosting a teacher and they come from NOAA or Department of Interior, they work for the Park Service or you know some other agency, NASA, um, feel free to um, give them our contact information and um, Sarah and I will talk to them about um, how it works when, when they're not NSF funded. Um, or there might be an international research team that you know of and that you're connected with in polar science. So if you know of somebody else that's doing work in the polar regions and they, you aren't sure about their funding or they aren't sure about their funding, just let us have them uh, call us and we'll talk to them about how it works. Because we do pair researchers and teachers that are outside of NSF funding, but we'll talk to them separately about that. So I guess are there any questions from the phone people? No. No? All right. Thank you okay. everybody. All right. Well, you know how to find us. Feel free to uh, contact us if you have any questions. And uh, we look forward to all your applications. Thanks Thank for joining us today. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. Take care. Bye-bye now. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Sure.